tomb of Caiaphas, the high priest of the Jewish people, who the gospel state sent Jesus to the Romans to be crucified. Two nails were found in the tomb. Could they be the nails that crucified Jesus? Decoding the ancients is the job of investigative journalist Simka Yakubovich. From deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land, Simka tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. In 1990, here in Jerusalem, just a few meters down this hill, workers building a park, now called the Peace Park, made the most amazing archaeological discovery. They found a 2,000-year-old burial tomb. But it wasn't just the burial tomb of anybody. It was the burial tomb of someone mentioned in the Gospels, the high priest Caiaphas. And he's the man that, according to the Gospels, is partially responsible for sending Jesus to the cross. For nearly 2,000 years, Caiaphas' tomb was left undisturbed. Then, in 1990, construction workers stumbled upon a rather large burial site. The Israeli Antiquities Authority, or IAA, sent out archaeologists to excavate the site. What they found was a first century Jewish tomb. Inside, there were four kohims, or burial niches. And inside these, there were 12 ossuaries or bone boxes. These limestone coffins where the bones of the dead are laid included the ossuary which bears the inscription, Joseph, son of Caiaphas. That story made headlines. But here's a story that didn't make headlines. Nobody reports that, in fact, Nobody knows if that tomb still exists. Archaeologists don't know if it was destroyed when the park was built. Nobody cares. And here's something else that no media, no media whatsoever reported. Inside that tomb, they found two Roman nails. Wait a minute, they found two nails in the tomb of the man who sent Jesus to the cross and nobody reports it? Why? And what's more, where are they? The first stop in any investigation involving an Israeli archaeological site is the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem. It is headquarters for the Israeli Antiquities Authority. These archives house the original reports of every archaeological excavation supervised by the IAA. Simca locates the 1990 Caiaphas tomb archaeological file. In it, he discovers the original drawing of the tomb. He also finds the final unedited report. And this includes detailed drawings, measurements, and photographs. And although the two Roman nails are mentioned, there are no photographs, measurements, drawings, or any information as to their current whereabouts. The main find is the now famous ossuary inscribed with the name Joseph, son of Caiaphas. The Christian Gospels simply call him Caiaphas. The first century historian Josephus mentions a high priest called Joseph Caiaphas. What's written on the ossuary, however, is Joseph, son of Caiaphas. Believing Josephus is closer to the truth, scholars generally agree that despite the different versions, this is the bone box of the man who sent Jesus to the cross. To understand why Caiaphas would do such a thing, we have to understand the specific historical context in which the confrontation between Jesus and Caiaphas took place. The date was 30 AD was under Roman occupation. Even the Jewish religious elite had to answer directly to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. The Roman authorities had appointed Caiaphas to the high priesthood, the most prestigious and powerful position a Jew could hold. According to the Gospels, on the Jewish holiday of Passover, Jerusalem was bursting with religious fervor. And supported by a large gathering of followers, Jesus came to the temple. The holiest
sight in all of Judaism. He drove the cattle herders and dove sellers out, overturned the tables of the money changers. Then he warned the Romans, destroy this temple, and in three days, I will raise it up. Talking to the Roman authorities in this way was tantamount to a call for revolt. There was a near riot and Caiaphas to keep order as Jesus arrested and put on trial. Jesus is hastily convicted of inciting opposition to the Romans and turned over to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. The Gospels state that Pilate sends Jesus to the cross and famously washes his hands of the deed. Caiaphas is left to bear the burden. We don't know whether he was or wasn't troubled by the outcome of his decision. This Algeria, which uh, has a archaeological connection with the Gospels, was excavated in the uh, 1990s from uh, the promenade in the southern part of Jerusalem. There is an inscription, you can see it on the side of the Algeria, it mentions Caiaphas. Caiaphas, who was the high priest in the time of Jesus, and Jesus is mentioned to be judged by Caiaphas. The ossuary has been set around the world, and millions of onlookers have had a chance to view it in person, witnessing up close what scholars believe to be the first ever discovery of a man who came in contact with Jesus. But is it really the ossuary of the man who sent Jesus to the cross? To answer that question, Simca meets with David Mevera, a curator at the Israel Museum. Here's my question. How are you so convinced that this is the Caiaphas? It is a rare name. It's a name that we know from both Jewish sources and from the New Testament. And it is good in dating and timing for that period. And the most elaborate ossuary, very luckily for us, had twice an inscription on it naming Joseph son of Caiaphas, the one that we know from the New Testament. So it's definitely the tomb, as all tombs were, of a clan. It's a priestly clan. So the Caiaphas clan were buried in that tomb. Scholars generally agree with Dr. Mevra. Caiaphas is a rare name, and the ossuary is very ornate, befitting a high priest. But what happened to the nails found inside the tomb? A starting point would be to find the location of the tomb itself. In search of the nails of the crucifixion, Simca is on his way to the Peace Park to look for the tomb. He has two clues. First, according to the archaeological report, there should be a playground nearby. But even if he finds the playground, how does he identify the tomb if it's been covered up? The second clue is provided by Jewish religious law. According to this law, before sealing a tomb, the archaeologist must insert a nephesh or pipe for the free flow of spirits that once inhabited the tomb. The nephesh is somewhere in this park, but where? Okay guys, this is it. At least I hope it's it. There's supposed to be some kind of children's park or something nearby. And we're looking for a green pipe sticking out of the ground. Each one of us grab one of these terraces and let's find a tomb. Even if they are in the right place, what are the odds that the pipe is still accessible and not overgrown with bushes? But if the pipe and the playground can be found together, then the Caiaphas tomb would be rediscovered. Look, here's the playground. Hey guys, found the pipe. Looks like this is our pipe. Just saw another pipe by the playground over there. Looks similar. Another pipe? No, but then there's two tombs, you understand? There's there no seems one. to be two tombs close to one another. One of them is the Caiaphas tomb. Given that his intention is to put a camera down the pipe to look for the missing Roman yeah. nails, Simca has to ascertain whether the pipe is clear or obstructed. Something is blocking it. We need a GPR, we need a ground penetrating radar. But the good thing is this is pretty The lovely. pipes indicate that the Caiaphas tomb was not destroyed in 1990 by the people building this park. In the original report, there is a mention of a second tomb found near the Caiaphas tomb. But the 
ceiling was collapsed and it was deemed unsafe. Ground penetrating radar should reveal which tomb is the collapsed one and which is the Kaifas tomb. Susinka has brought in GPR specialists to help determine whether what lies below the pipe may actually be the Kaifas tomb. First, they go to the tomb that is farthest from the playground. So it may be quite exciting because we may have an excavated and an unexcavated tomb. Basically what I'm hoping is that you and your work can throw some light on it. Ground penetrating radar can be used to determine whether areas below the surface hold ancient archaeological sites. GPR works by bouncing sound waves through rock. Okay, next line. And getting feedback, revealing different densities and open spaces. It looks like there's something there. I have been seeing something around this one and a half meter depth. It has more potential to being a collapsed cave than being an open cave. The radar shows that the first location seems to correspond to the information pertaining to the collapsed tomb not the Kaifa's tomb. I think that we should pack up and move. My gut feel? Yeah. We're gonna, this is gonna be, you're gonna have a nice open space here. 4.24 is on your end. Okay. display, the tomb itself was covered over. More than that, two Roman nails found in the tomb disappeared. They were not sketched, photographed, measured, or archived. Could it be that they were the nails that were used to crucify Jesus? Is it possible that Caiaphas kept them as some kind of morbid souvenir of the most infamous execution in history? Although we know that tens of thousands of people were crucified, the fact is that there exists only one archaeological artifact attesting to this gruesome practice. It was found in 1970 here in Jerusalem. The artifact is a crucified heel now being kept in a lab at Tel Aviv University. When it was found, it made international headlines. Scholars went out of their way to say that the crucified heel did not belong to Jesus, but rather to a man called Jonathan, who lived around Jesus' lifetime. The heel has never been exhibited in public due to religious sensibilities. Nonetheless, Professor Hershkovitz agrees to show it to Simka. This is the original. This is the only evidence we have for crucifixion in the world. In, in the world. I know it's very popular these days to say that they use some kind of ropes to tie the crucified person to the crossbow, but in a way this doesn't make sense because you can't do crucifixion without bloodshed. The whole philosophy is humiliation and punishment. I myself, I disregard the story of, of ropes, you know, for crucifixion. I think they were using nails, they were using probably short nails for the palm of the hand and longer nails for the heel bone. Classic uh, Jesus painting one going through the hand is more I, accurate. I believe so. According to Professor Hershkovitz, we learned from the crucified heel bone that there were at least four crucifixion nails used, two on the heels on either side of the upright post, and at least one or two on each hand. And we now know from the heel bone that 
nails had to be at least 12 centimeters long for the heels. But we still don't know how big the hand nails had to be. Now that Simkin knows what a crucifixion nail looks like, he heads back to the Rockefeller Museum. Archaeology is all about context and clusters of artifacts. If Simca is ever going to figure out the mystery of the missing nails from the Kaifas tomb, and whether they might be the nails of the crucifixion, he has to find out what other artifacts were found with the nails. And here, there is no lack of detailed information, including the nails. The report lists five items. All of them have to do with the afterlife. The first find mentioned is an oil lamp. Oil lamps were used to commemorate the dead. The second artifact is a glass perfume bottle. These expensive bottles were associated with women. Unlike today, each woman had her own perfume mixture. So it is likely that the scent of a woman was associated with her soul. After all, perfume is associated with scent, and scent in Jewish tradition is associated with the afterlife. The next item is the most surprising. One would not expect to find it in the tomb of a Jewish high priest. It is a Roman coin found in the skull of a woman buried in the tomb. A coin in the skull is common to pagan burials, not Jewish ones. Coins were placed under the tongue of the deceased so that the soul of the dead could pay the boatman crossing the mythical river Styx in Hades. After the flesh rotted, the coin fell into the skull. The presence of the coin in the skull shows that this family of Jewish high priests were influenced by Roman burial practices. So the coin was also associated with the afterlife. And then there were the nails. What possible connection could they have with the afterlife? As it turns out, in first century Judaism, only one type of nail was associated with the afterlife. Nails used in crucifixion. They were considered to be a powerful talisman, protecting their owner in this life and the next. Taken together, the ossuary, the lamp, the glass bottle, and the coin all tell the same story. An obsession with the afterlife. It seems the only reason that nails would be part of this cluster is that they were used to crucify someone. And since Caiaphas is associated with only one crucifixion, could they be the nails that were driven into Jesus? You're excavating Caiaphas's tomb. You find iron nails. You think, ah, nails. You know, you could say, look, crucifying Jesus was a small event in Caiaphas's life. He's the priest. He has many things to do. Jesus was not important. He's important to us, but to him, he was just one more guy he got rid of. I don't think that's the case. He might not have known the day it happened. This is going to become the biggest thing in my life. This is going to haunt me to my grave. But I think by the time he died, that act was major. So if there were crucifixion nails in the Caiaphas tomb, I don't think most of us would say, oh, well, this is just a coincidence. It's a little indication of something much bigger. To see if the nails were left in the Kaifas tomb, Simca is attempting to lower cameras into the so-called soul pipe. But the soul pipe over the Kaifas tomb is blocked. Now that the GPR has shown Simca where the Kaifas tomb is, Simca has to get around the blockage of the pipe. So he calls a pipe expert, namely a plumber. Because there is an elbow at the top of the pipe, Ezra the plumber can't get his equipment down. So he elects to cut a hole in the side of the pipe, just above ground level, which can later be welded shut. Looks like there's just garbage on it. Yeah, that's the bottom. With the 
obstruction gone, Simca might be able to lower a camera down the soul pipe and into the Kaifa's tomb, hopefully revealing the missing nails. That's good, it looks clear. <laughs> I see the curve, it looks empty, I didn't expect it. Simca now gathers his team that includes experts at working robotic cameras. After due preparation, they're finally ready to put a camera down the pipe. Bill Tarrant is one of these experts. All right, so go for it. All right, we're going to go for it. His high-resolution camera, once lowered into the tomb, may detect the nails if they're still there. Okay, there we go. So hopefully you'll have beautiful images for me. Okay. Going through one pipe. There's the other part of the pipe. With these clear, high-resolution images from the camera, are Simka and his team on the verge of finding the nails of the crucifixion? Simka is investigating a first-century Jerusalem burial tomb. Identified as the last resting place of the high priest Caiaphas, who sent Jesus to the cross. Strangely, two Roman nails found in the cave, possibly associated with crucifixion, have gone missing, and the cave itself has been covered over. Simca has located the tomb and a pipe that leads into it. In the hope of locating the nails, a high-resolution camera has been lowered into the pipe. At first, everything looks good. There's the other part of the pipe. Sitting at the elbow, the camera can now see into the second pipe. I'm zooming in. Unfortunately, spikes used to secure the joints of the pipe prevent the camera from traveling further. Simca now has to call for a smaller, more flexible camera, but it has to come from another town, so everything has been put on hold. Okay, coffee break. Okay. okay. Ignored by the majority of scholars is the fact that there wasn't one, but two ossuaries with the Caiaphas inscription found in the tomb. A simple ossuary bearing the name Caiaphas and an ostentatious ossuary bearing the name Joseph, son of Caiaphas. The first century historian Josephus mentions a high priest, Joseph Caiaphas. This is taken by scholars to be one and the same as the Joseph, son of Caiaphas, buried in the fancy ossuary. So, they have identified this ossuary with the Jewish high priest from the time of Jesus. But the Gospels do not call the high priest who sent Jesus to the cross, Joseph Caiaphas, or Joseph, son of Caiaphas. They simply called that high priest, Caiaphas. Can it be that although the Gospel writers talk about one high priest called Caiaphas, there were actually two, two from the same family? One was indeed ostentatious, but the other one was modest. Can it be we've been focusing on the wrong Caiaphas all along? To find out more about the real Caiaphas of the Jesus story, Simca now travels what would have been a 20-day journey at the time of Jesus to modern-day Turkey and on to a small town called Antioch. Early Jesus' followers fled here to escape Roman persecution, and it is here that the Christian movement itself was born. Simca meets New Testament scholar Barry Wilson. He's hoping to get a better sense of the historical Caiaphas to determine which ossuary belongs to the high priest who confronted Jesus. Fantastic mountain <laughs> riddled with tunnels. Those holes? These were the escape routes of early Christians when they were fleeing from the Romans. It's a fantastic network within this mountain. This is where they practiced Christianity before it was an official religion, before it was recognized. That's right. They had to remain underground. Uh, they used caves as churches here. This was the earliest Vatican. The Christians who worshipped here had access to texts that were later suppressed by the Western Church. One of these deals with Caiaphas. There's a very interesting document that dates from uh, the 6th century, possibly earlier. It's preserved in an Arabic source. And this is an amazing document because it starts off by saying that this is the book of the high priest, the one called Caiaphas. So it's a book that's allegedly written by the high priest Caiaphas. He's the bad guy. He was the bad guy. He was implicated with Pontius Pilate uh, at the trial of Jesus. 
But he says in this document about Jesus, this is the one whom we adore. This is the one who for our sakes uh, became incarnate. This is the one who for our sakes redeemed us and who has blessed us with everlasting compassion. This is the high priest, the Jewish high priest, the one of the two most powerful leaders in Judea of the time, presented as speaking with a Christian voice. This text, representing a little-known Christian tradition, portrays Caiaphas not as a villain, but as a devout follower of Jesus. But if this text is accurate, this means that the Gospels distorted the truth about Caiaphas. Well, you know, Caiaphas' tomb has been found. Yes. Did you know that there were nails? No, I didn't know that. They've disappeared. They've disappeared. That's a remarkable absence. Why would it be so remarkable? If an Israeli archaeologist said, ah, it's just nails, what would you say to them? Well, I would want to find out what was so significant about these nails that it would be associated with the burial of uh, Caiaphas. For you, this is an important question. It's an important question. You wouldn't brush it up? No. You wouldn't lose the nails? No. No. The nails are an important clue to something, some link to some other historic person. There's only one crucified person that Caiaphas is linked to. Yeah, that's linked to Jesus. Armed with the knowledge that there is an alternative Christian tradition depicting Caiaphas as a good guy, and knowing that in the Caiaphas tomb a modest ossuary was found, Simca now heads back to Jerusalem to see what more he can learn about the real Caiaphas. Historian Dr. Helen Bond has spent much of her career examining the life of this prominent high priest. In her writings, she argues that the Gospel's portrayal of Caiaphas is historically inaccurate. She now takes Simca to a church, which according to Christian tradition, is built where Caiaphas once lived. Since Caiaphas was also a judge, one would expect to find holding cells under his home. And indeed, that's precisely what archaeologists have found here. Jesus could have been held right here the night he was arrested. The Gospels tend to caricature the high priest. He's shown as jealous of Jesus. He's completely corrupt. The whole trial narrative in Mark's Gospel, for example, is a kangaroo court. It's a terrible picture of a Jewish high priest that comes over. It's a long way from historical accuracy. And the reason for that, I think, is that all of the Gospels are written at the end of the first century, at a time when Christians and Jews are starting to go their separate ways. And so in a way, Caiaphas is sort of a victim of this. He becomes caught up in all of this negativity and portrayed in a very negative way. And I think Caiaphas has suffered because of that. Um, there's nobody particularly interested in rehabilitating him. So what if Caiaphas never meant for Jesus to be crucified, merely arrested? What if, as the alternative Caiaphas tradition suggests, he became a follower rather than a persecutor of Jesus? Perhaps by re-examining the limestone coffins, Simca will be able to determine which Caiaphas is the one who confronted Jesus. We have now located Caiaphas' tomb by identifying a pipe that leads into it. Maybe by re-examining the ossuaries that came from that tomb, we will be able to determine whether Caiaphas is really the bad guy of the Gospels, or whether he was a good guy who took two of the crucifixion nails with him to the grave. To analyze and compare the two ossuaries, Simca has come to the Israel Museum, where both are currently stored. He's first shown the famous ossuary scholars believe once held the bones of the historic Caiaphas. Remarkably, after 2,000 years, it's in unbelievably good shape. Look at this. I've seen a lot of ossuaries, and this is... It's the most beautiful I've ever seen. Yeah, it is one of the most beautiful I've ever seen. Yeah, it's, look, look how elaborate. Many of the fancier ossuaries are decorated with what scholars call rosettes. Although their exact meaning is not known, many scholars dismiss the design as merely decorative, an ostentatious display of wealth and status. 
Simca now examines the famous inscription. See, this is what we couldn't see when it was on the shelf. It's so clear. It's Joseph, son of Aramaic, Bar Kaifa. There it is. The evidence seems to support the argument that this ossuary held the bones of the historic Kaifas. But Simca is now shown the second, more modest Kaifas ossuary. The amazing thing about this one is that this one actually is more consistent with what it says in the Gospels. Because there it doesn't say Joseph, son of Kaifa, it just says Kaifa. Incredibly, it is this inscription which just states Kaifas that matches the Gospels. Scholars have ignored it because they prefer first century historian Josephus as a source and they are dazzled by the fancy ossuary. But it is the name inscribed on this simple ossuary that is more consistent with the Gospels. It's beautiful and it's modest, and this one is consistent not with the bad guy Caiaphas, but with the good guy Caiaphas. Mm -hmm. This second Caiaphas ossuary also has rosettes, though clearly less elaborate. Still, they are consistent with the status of a high priest. Intriguingly, there's also an enigmatic symbol between the two rosettes, which has never been decoded. It shows five temple-like steps supporting a pillar, with seven cornices, and between the cornices, six arrows pointing heavenward. It definitely has here symbolism. It has several steps leading up and with arrows pointing heavenward. As early as the first century, the pillar becomes a symbol for Jesus of Nazareth and the emerging church. Later, it even makes an appearance in the heart of the Vatican in Michelangelo's painting in the Sistine Chapel. But there is yet one more curious element to the exterior design. Two seemingly insignificant circular patterns, one on each side of the face of the ossuary. Interestingly, they are not positioned at the four corners of the ossuary's facade, as you would expect from something simply ornamental. Instead, there are only two of them, and they appear on either side of the pillar. According to the authoritative Rachmani catalog of ossuaries, those circles represent two nail heads. Simka is taken aback by his discovery and realizes that he doesn't know where in the tomb the missing Roman nails were found. Were they found somewhere close to the ostentatious ossuary? Or were they found closer to the more modest ossuary? Looking at the initial field report written at the tomb's discovery, the evidence is inconclusive. One nail was found outside the fancy Caiaphas ossuary. Incredibly, the other was found inside an ossuary. But strangely, that ossuary is not identified. Why? Could it be that it was the plain Caiaphas ossuary? What do you make of a nail in an ossuary? At all sites, anywhere in Jerusalem, I've dug right here in Jerusalem, we find 10 nails a day. But we're not in a Jewish tomb. We're in a residential area like this. I'm sure many nails were found right behind me when this was excavated. But if there's a nail in the ossuary, then it opens another possibility that there's something like the coins in the mouth of the skull, some sort of superstition going on here. Uh, the belief attested in a number of sources that a crucifixion nail has a great magical power to ward off evil, to ward off bad luck, maybe to help you in the afterlife. Can it be that it is the simple ossuary that belonged to the high priest and that the secret of the tomb is that Caiaphas took Jesus' nails with him to the grave? To answer that, we need the nails, but the nails are missing and there is no photograph of them in the original report. In the hope that the photographs do exist, Simka now tracks down the original photographer of the site. The photographer is Gero Nalbandian. He was hired by the archaeologists to photograph all the artifacts found in the tomb. So your mission was to shoot all the artifacts? Yes. From the tomb? Yes. Okay, let's see what you have. That's the ossuary? Yes. This is the oil lamp. This is the coin. 
find the nails? Did you shoot the nails? Uh, I, no. There were no nails? They did not give, show me the nails. But you asked for all the artifacts? Yes. What the artifacts, it was there from the tomb. They give it to me, I photograph it. No nails? No nails, I did not see nails. So the nails mysteriously disappeared before Garrow had a chance to photograph them for the final report. Something doesn't make sense. Nails just don't disappear. Israeli archaeologists aren't bad. They're good archaeologists. These are not simple nails that were found in a wooden coffin or a building site or in a boat. These were special Roman nails in Caiaphas' tomb, one of them inside his ossuary. I just can't believe that they simply disappeared. As night falls, Simka gets back to the business of introducing a small camera in the now covered up tomb of Caiaphas. After hours of waiting, the second camera finally arrives. It is much smaller and more flexible than the one that got stuck earlier. Called a push camera, it has a better chance of moving past the obstructions in the pipe. Working into the night, the crew is finally able to maneuver the push camera past the screws that stopped them before. Oh. Okay, okay Abby, fill down. More, more. Okay, hold it right there. There it is. I see what's going on. Here's the ground, the way they yeah. found it. They went inside and they pulled out the ossuaries. And there's the entrance. Simka can now clearly see the outside of the tomb of the high priest Caiaphas. But there's a problem. That is cement. Because they had to put cement here to fortify whatever they were doing. The walls are reinforced with concrete. If you can get past that, can you get past that, Abby? Can you go a little bit more? The camera probe inside the pipe that leads to Caiaphas' tomb has hit another problem. That is cement. Can you go a little bit more? Can you maneuver it to the side? More, that's it. The camera won't reach all the way inside the Caiaphas tomb. The only way to do that would be to get an excavation license and drill new holes. Even if that were possible, the application process would take years. Okay, so three meters, yeah. and there's probably another one. From what we're looking ahead, yeah. The opening is right here. here. To the, the tomb is under this roadway right here. There's no getting into a tomb paved over by a road. But Simka has learned something. Now we know it exists. The entrance is unobstructed and it's under this, this road. The point is, there's only one set of missing artifacts. It's the most important set, and that's the nails. Unfortunately, Simka and his crew are unable to gain access to the tomb. If the nails are still inside, we'll never know. But can artifacts from tomb sites simply vanish? Simka has now asked to speak with Svi Greenhut, the archaeologist who ran the Caiaphas tomb dig. Unfortunately, he has refused an interview. The IAA has offered up fellow archaeologist Gideon Avni to speak in his stead. In the tomb, there's two Roman nails. Okay. Doesn't someone go, wow, I've poured through the material, but there is no measurement or pictures of the nails. You have to realize, in this country every year, you have 300 excavations. The number of artifacts found in these excavations goes to tens of millions. And minor elements, like nails, either they were lost in the stage of uh, uh, processing or uh, storage, or they were mixed with some other uh, context. I'm representing this government uh, institution. There was a question asked about this nail. We checked all the records relevant to uh, this tomb, and we discovered that we don't have the nails. Nails can be either lost or found their way into some uh, other registry or whatever. When you said it could be lost or find itself in some other registry, you mean like not really lost but internally misfiled in a way? It's a possibility. Meaning it could be sitting in, in some lab or a shelf? Maybe. Gideon Avenue has made me think. Maybe the nails have been under our noses the whole time. 
if my hunch is right, and the Israeli archaeologists who were involved in the Caiaphas tomb suspected that the Roman nails found there had something to do with crucifixion, maybe they send them to Professor Herskovich's lab at Tel Aviv University. Now, he's a forensic anthropologist. He deals with bone, not nails. But crucifixion is where bone meets nail. So maybe someone sent the nails there. Maybe that's the right address for our investigation. We've been tracking two nails that went missing. The Antiquities Authority, they say it's probably misplaced. Did, did you ever get two nails together? Yes, we have two nails uh, together. Yes, sure. From Jerusalem? From Jerusalem. Uh, can, we go, <laughs> can we go look? Sure, absolutely. So these are the nails? Yes, these are the two nails from Jerusalem that arrived to the lab more than 15 years ago from the Second Temple period. Could it be 18 years ago? Yeah, could be. It's the only example of two nails arriving together? Yes. The fact that they're bent this way, would this be consistent with crucifixion? It could be. Why would they bend the nail? If you put a nail through the palm of the hand, you can, you can easily free the hand. But if you put a nail through the palm of the hand, and then you stick it to the wood by actually bending the nail. The palm of the hands are attached firmly to the course bar. So the fact they're bent is more consistent with crucifixion than if you saw them straight. Yes, I would say so. The Caiaphas nails were found in a specific chemical setting. One was outside the limestone ossuaries, and one was inside an ossuary. If these are the Caiaphas nails, one should have a heavy limestone deposit collected from inside the ossuary, and one should be limestone free, since it was found outside the ossuaries. Incredibly, that's just what Professor Herskovitz finds. One doesn't have limestone on it, but the other one does. So what do you see? The remnants of lime on the nail, you know, limestone. Most ossuaries are made of uh, limestone. Furthermore, Professor Herskovitz finds that the heads of the nails are similar to the only crucifixion nail found anywhere, which is also in Professor Herskovitz's lab. So it seems that these are the missing nails. The nails which may have come from Jesus's cross. Why is nobody as excited as I am? You know, crucifixion is a very sensitive issue from the religious point of view. I believe that most people prefer to leave it aside. So it seems that religious sensitivities, not science, dictated policy towards these nails. If Caiaphas kept the nails of Jesus for whatever reasons, he felt bad, he felt it would have healing powers, he felt that this shows he has power over him, whatever, this could be the nails of the crucifixion. Here on the campus of Tel Aviv University, our investigation is complete. The fact is that the world may be looking at the wrong Caiaphas ossuary. The man buried in the modest one may be the high priest who faced Jesus at his trial. Furthermore, I think we've made the strongest archaeological argument ever that two of the nails used in the crucifixion have been found. Was it the ostentatious Caiaphas who kept them as an amulet for the afterlife? Or was it modest Caiaphas who kept them as a sign of devotion? We may never know, but the fact is that these nails were found in the tomb of the man who sent Jesus to the cross.